Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you all here today. Um, and I would like to welcome you to Connecticut's Old State House. My name is Rebecca Tabor Conover. I'm head of public pro programs here. And it is a special pleasure to be hosting this program on the Amistad today. As many of you know, the Old State House has a very direct connection with the Amistad case as the opening hearings were held in our building, both here in the courtroom and upstairs in the Senate chamber. We're extremely fortunate to have as our program moderator, Diane Smith. As many of you know, Diane is truly a Connecticut treasure. She is both an Emmy award-winning journalist and now a New York Times bestseller author and the Connecticut Network's senior producer for program development. Please join me in welcoming Diane. Thank you, and I'm so glad you could all be here today for this special program. We are taping this for CTN, so uh, you can let your friends and associates know that they, if they missed it live, they can see it on television and they can download it. I'm really glad that you could be here today to join us to learn about what we were calling the hidden history of the Amistad Rebellion. And I know that this rebellion is one of the best known events in the history of American slavery. And since so much of the story takes place right here in Connecticut and right here in this building, I think that most of us assume that we know everything there is to know about this story. But our speaker today is going to prove the opposite. Dr. Marcus Redeker is the author of the new book, The Amistad Rebellion, An Atlantic Odyssey of Slavery and Freedom. As Professor Redeker points out, this story has been told mostly from the elite perspective of the judges, the politicians, and the abolitionists who are involved in this case. In his new book, Professor Redeker reclaims the rebellion for the African rebels who risked death to stake a claim for freedom and tells us the story from the bottom up, if you will. Using some newly discovered evidence, he shows how a small group of courageous men fought and won an epic battle against Spanish and American slaveholders and their powerful governments. His work shows that the actions aboard the Amistad and in the days and the months that followed were certainly pivotal events in American history, but maybe not for the reasons that we've always thought. It is a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Marcus Redeker, who is a distinguished professor of Atlantic history at the University of Pittsburgh. Today he'll speak about his book and about his recent trip to Sierra Leone, the homeland of the Amistad Africans, where he interviewed people about their knowledge of the uprising. Professor? Thank you, Diane. Thanks to all of you for coming. I must say it is a special pleasure to be here, specifically here, in this room, in this place that has such a significant connection uh, to the Amistad story, and to be in a state where the story means so much. You know, I salute the work of the Amistad Committee which for many years has been trying to keep alive the memory of this important event. Uh, and I think uh, it's just a very significant part of the public history of Connecticut. The book that I've written, which Diane very kindly introduced, is one that tries to look at the rebellion in a new way. And I'll tell you how I came to do this work. Previously, I had written a book called The Slave Ship, A Human History. This is a pretty gruesome story about the hundreds, if not thousands, of British and American slave ships that hauled millions of people from West Africa to American plantations, throughout the Americas, I might say. In doing that work, what I found, and what many other scholars have found, is that rebellions on slave ships were much more common than we knew. For a long time, we thought there were only a handful. Now we know that one in every 10 slaving voyages experienced an insurrection that led to significant loss of life among the crew or among the Africans who rose up. Now, this in itself is important because slave ships were designed to prevent that kind of resistance. The very design of the ships 
the way people were shackled and manacled. The ship itself is meant to prevent all this, and yet that kind of resistance still went on. To me, this is a very important part of the story, that people would never accept that reality. They fought back, even under the most extreme circumstances. Now, even though there were a lot of these rebellions, we know that they overwhelmingly failed. And when they failed, the decks of the ships ran red with blood. Because inevitably what happened after the crew put down a slave insurrection was they picked out the ringleaders and made examples of them with the most gruesome tortures you can imagine. I'm talking about cutting off limbs, cutting off heads, and making the other enslaved people who were all called up on deck to watch this to hold the severed heads of the rebels all to increase the torture and the terror, to try to make those other people more pliant and manageable for the rest of the voyage. Well, as I'm watching one defeat after another, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about the Amistad Rebellion, which is one of the very few successful slave revolts. And so I had a question. I had a fundamental question. How did they do it? How did they actually manage to rise up, organize themselves to fight, capture the ship, and then secure their freedom? So one of the very first things I did was to go out and read all of the scholarly literature with that question in mind. How did they do it? And guess what I found? Nobody was really interested in that question. It was somehow taken for granted that well, it was just a slave ship, and they rose up, and end of story. And the most important thing, anyway, was the court case. Well, the court case was certainly very important. But without the rebellion on the decks of the Amistad, there's no court case. Without the capture of this vessel... John Quincy Adams has nobody to defend before the Supreme Court. So the thing I wanted to do was to put the rebellion back at the heart of the story and then to see how everything else looks different in relationship to that. And of course, the thing that I found was that you can't understand that rebellion unless you know who these people who made it actually were. And folks, they were Africans. The key to the story, in my view, lay in West Africa, more specifically in southern and eastern Sierra Leone, where all of the 53 men and children came from, those people aboard the Amistad, that fateful day of the rebellion. Who were they? How did they organize themselves? Well, the key to understanding this was to, first of all, place it in a comparative perspective of other slave revolts on board ships and ask, what was different about this one? Well, one thing was different about this one. There was a concentration of one particular group of people on board called the Mende, who are the largest single cultural group in Sierra Leone, and it turns out that the way the slave trade was working in that region, a Spanish slave trader named Pedro Blanco was working with an African king, uh, the Vi king named Siaka, who was organizing these warring parties to capture mostly Mende people, bring them to the coast, ship them to the New World, in this case to Cuba. Okay, so the key to the story becomes, what was their experience back in southern Sierra Leone in the 1830s. Well, the single most important political fact of Sierra Leone in those days was the expansion of the slave trade. So one very salient fact is that all of the Amistad men were trained warriors, warriors to defend their villages against these attacks by King Shaka's soldiers and warriors. 
So how they then waged war became very important. We have here two heroes of the story. We know about John Quincy Adams. We know less about Cinque, although he was certainly very famous in his day. His, uh, his African name, we think, was Sengbe or Shengbe, as the Mende say. He was a Mende man. And I found evidence to suggest that he was well known as a warrior before he ever set foot on that slave ship. I don't mean just a warrior, I mean a leading warrior. And I think there's actually a fair chance that King Shaka may have had a bounty on his head. This is something I learned actually in this trip to Sierra Leone that I took in May. I'll say more about that in a moment. But what I want to suggest is that if you know the African side of the story, a lot of things that we thought we understood before began to look a little different. And the main thing that I found was that there was a means of self-organization among all of the Africans in the hold of the Amistad, which was really crucial to their victory. It turns out all men, whether you were Mende or Kono or Temne or Bandi, there were about 10 or 11 different ethnicities on the Amistad, but again, two-thirds of them Mende. And again, among those people, almost all of them spoke three or four languages, so they had an unusual ability to communicate with each other. But they all had been members of the Poro society in their respective home cultures. This was a, an organization that basically governed social life. It mediated disputes, it punished witchcraft, it provided social discipline, and it declared war. So the more I read about these Poro societies, the more I was convinced that what was happening in the hold of the Amistad was a Poro meeting, a displaced Poro meeting. But there's a dilemma. Every person initiated into the Poro society takes a vow on pain of death never to mention its secrets. And true to that vow, Nothing was said about the Poro Society by any of the Amistad Africans the entire time they were in America. Now, this poses a problem for a historian who's looking for evidence. But finally, evidence did come out. And that evidence came when they returned to Sierra Leone with five American missionaries. And at that moment where they stepped ashore in Freetown, which now, by the way, has got about 50 different African ethnicities, people captured from slave ships by British slaving vessels. This included some of the family members of the Amistad Africans. When they are going ashore, the missionaries want them to go dressed in Western clothing and singing a hymn, a Christian hymn, to announce that they have a new identity. But it didn't really work out that way because the first thing the men started doing was taking off their shirts. And the missionaries scream, this is the reversion to barbarism and heathenism and licentiousness, when in fact it was nothing of the sort. The men took off their shirts to show their country marks, the scarifications which indicated which ethnic group they were a part of. Because the Mende had one set of scars, the Temne had a different set of scars, so their these are all Poro marks. These are the marks you get when you are initiated into the Poro society. And the interesting thing about the Mende is that most of their marks are on the torso, so you can't see them in this particular painting of Cinque, but I did find evidence of someone who saw him in jail without his shirt, and he mentioned the scarifications. So he was a Poro member like others. Margru is well, very well known as one of the four children of the Amistad. Grabeau is less well known, but he was remarked as a man who was heavily tattooed. And what that meant was that he had a great many of these Poro marks. And the way that worked was that after one is initiated, with each step into higher levels of knowledge, 
one gets additional scarifications. And so he was, I've suggested, a very high-ranking member of the Poro. And the moment that any of the other Africans laid eyes on his body, they would have known that he was an extremely important person. So the Poro Society, I think, really was important. And I'll just mention that when I was in Freetown, I had the occasion to interview a man named Ernest Ndomahina, who is at present the senior ranking member of the still existing Mende Secret Military Society, which keeps all the lore of warriors. And I asked him the question, how would this multi-ethnic group of people be able to cooperate and organize a rebellion in the hold of the Amistad? And he said, much to my relief, it would all depend on their knowledge of the Poro Society because that's what they had in common. Because what they were doing in the hold of the vessel was taking a decision to declare war. They were going to war against the owners of the vessel, and that's the kind of thing the Poro Society always described. I'll just mention that Grabo, or what I now know uh, to be a man with a different name, Gilabaru, we went to his village in eastern Sierra Leone, a place called Folu, and I'm happy to tell you we're about 90% sure that we found one of his descendants because he came back to the village after the repatriation. If people want to know more about that later, we can discuss it. This will give you a brief idea of where people came from. You can see the Mende drawn in the interior. This, I think, is the first time Mende ever appeared on a map in Europe or the United States because they were not very well known. Most European travelers to Africa had not been that far into the interior. But on the coast there, you can see, just on the water's edge, a place called Lomboko. That was the slave trading factory where all of the Amistad Africans were shipped out. You see where it says Vi, that was the location of King Shaka. Lomboco was where the Spanish slave trader Pedro Blanco was set up. Um, we did engage in a search for the, the ruins of Lomboco slave trading factory, and with the help of local fishermen, we found it. This is a, an image of a Temne warrior from the 1820s, and I use this to illustrate, once again, how if you know the African side of the story, things look a little different. This, uh, the Temne warrior is here with, uh, pictured with the preferred weapon of the Temne warriors, a bow and arrow with uh, the arrows being poisoned. But notice what he has around his neck. Well, I read a description of Sinke, the very first time he walked into a legal hearing at New London, before they were shipped to New Haven and then to Hartford, someone who had no idea what he was describing said he walked into the room with a little snuff box attached to a ribbon around his neck. Exactly what you see right there. You know what that is? That's a warrior's grigri bag as it was called, in which spiritually powerful objects are placed in order to protect a warrior going into battle. So, so Sinke walked into his first court hearing in the struggle against slavery, armed literally as a warrior. How he got that from Sierra Leone to here is a very interesting question for me. I don't know how that happened. But, but again, his identity is that of an African warrior. Now, different African groups had different kinds of preferred weapons, and Mende warriors used not bows and arrows. They used cutlasses. A Mende warrior was a specialist in the use of a cutlass. So imagine when a box of cane knives was discovered on board the Amistad. And by the way, I found out, this has been one of the minor mysteries of the Amistad case about how they found the cane knives. It was the three little girls who were unshackled, who went around opening boxes and found them. And of course, they knew that Mende warriors used knives, and they told the men about them. And this became the way in which they won their freedom. 
I mean, imagine if you're a Mende warrior used to using a cutlass, and then you discover these knives. Is that not a gift from the ancestral spirits? Does that not tell you you're supposed to seize your freedom right now? We're going to put the weapon you're most accustomed to having right in your hands. And here's the famous image of how they used them. This was drawn, drawn by John Warner Barber, who was actually in the jail, who knew these people as individuals, and we can identify specific individuals here that he's drawn, but there's the result of this Mende warfare. This was the Mende style of warfare. The Poro society declares war in the hold of the ship. The Mende warriors, armed with the traditional instrument of war, go up and capture the vessel. And then they managed to sail it 1,400 miles to the northern end of Long Island. I couldn't disagree more with those people who act like they were lost. It's true they didn't know navigation. A lot of it was trial and error, but they did know how to set the sails. And they did know how to anchor, and they did know how to maneuver the ship because they stopped and anchored 30 times. The Spanish captain, the Cuban captain, Pedro Montes, realized they weren't going to make it to Africa. He said, I'll take you to another country where there is no slavery. It's called the United States. They didn't trust it. So I think there's significance, if we go back to the first image, to the fact that when they came ashore at the northern end of Long Island, Late August 1839, the first question they asked was not, do you have water because we're thirsty? It was not, do you have food because we're hungry? The one man who could speak a few words of English, Berna, said to these white hunters, is this slavery country? I suspect they had gone ashore in places further south and discovered that it was slavery country. In fact, we know that Montez wanted to take them to Charleston, South Carolina. What do you think would have happened had they gone ashore in Charleston, South Carolina? They would have been on the first ship back to Cuba, probably to be executed for the killing of Captain Ramon Ferrer. So the fact that they were able to sail the vessel and keep going north, they got to a place where slavery had been abolished in New York, 1827, where there was a chance that they could win their case in court. How they learned to sail the vessel is a very interesting question. I, I suspect that what happened was that several of the Amistad men had been on a deadly voyage across the ocean on a different slave ship, and as on many other slave ships, the crew got sick and some of the African men were taught how to set sails. There was one man they referred to in particular as knowing a lot about this, and it was Shule. So there's a... There's another history here, and it's this history from below. It's a history of people who organized themselves to do something that was really hard to do and did something that made, in the most unlikely of ways, all of the most powerful people in the world debate the meaning of what they had done. Now imagine this. You know, this motley gang of 53 Africans on a small vessel on the northern coast of Cuba, organized themselves and seize it, and in the subsequent two or three years, the, King of, the Queen of Spain, the Queen of England, the British Parliament, two American presidents, Supreme Court justices are all going to debate the meaning of what they did. So this, I think, is one of the things I'd, I'd leave you with as a thought about history from below. It does very surprising things. You can't predict when an event like this is going to have this kind of effect. And I submit to you, without knowing the African background, we really can't understand how it happened at all. Thank you very much. If we could have the panelists come up and join us, that would be wonderful. I. Um, I have to say that in all the years that I've been in Connecticut and I worked for many years in New Haven, I really did think I knew the story. And I really thought the story was about the triumph of the American legal system. And when we saw the Spielberg movie, didn't we all feel so good about that? Didn't we feel so sentimental about what 
justice had come to these people. And then in reading Marcus Redeker's book, I got a whole different side of the story that was so much more meaningful. And I encourage you to read the book as well and to join in this panel discussion if you'd like to ask questions. We'll be happy to bring a mic to you. So thank you so much, Professor. That was just great. Uh, joining us now is uh, Dr. Robert Wolf, who is a professor of history at Central Connecticut State University. He teaches courses on slavery in the Americas, as well as on the US Civil War and Reconstruction. He's currently working on a book about the Amistad Revolt. And uh, his most recent publication is a chapter in the upcoming anthology, Writing History in the Digital Age, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, very happy to have someone that a lot of uh, you may recognize, very well known in our community, Tammy Denise. Uh, she's a museum educator and a living history performing storyteller. Tammy specializes in bringing to life the stories of important but obscure women in American history. And uh, one of those is Margu, uh, one of the Amistad captives. You saw an image of her on the screen a few minutes ago. Uh, Tammy has a special interest in the topic of slavery. Her great-grandmother, or is it great-great-grandmother? Great-grandmother. Great-grandmother was a former enslaved person and lived to be well over 100 years old. And uh, it's a remarkable story. Um, Professor uh, Wolf, I'll start with you. Um, you wrote a very uh, strongly positive review of uh, Marcus Redeker's book. And you're writing your own book about this. Um, what is it about this story that resonates so that um, so many years later, we're still discovering new things about it and writing new treatises on it? Well, I think that the story has, as Marcus points out, it has these layers that have gone unnoticed. Um, one of the uh, things that I hope will come from this new book is that it will finally supplant um, a much older fictionalized account by William Owens called variously Slave Mutiny or Negro Mutiny. Um, and that book sort of fictionalized the story and had all sorts of sort of wild ideas about how, how slavery and anti-slavery worked. Um, and so here's this story that can be told in yet a new way, one that, as Marcus says, puts the Africans at the center of the tale. Mm -hmm. um, it truly is a phenomenal story. One other thing I should say is that um, the records are overwhelming. Um, the uh, records kept by what was later the American Missionary Association run to tens of thousands of pages on this one event. Mm -hmm. And that is sort of the well to which we all go. Mm -hmm. Uh, Marcus, I was uh, very f interested in your description of the captives as uh, people who were urban to some extent, multilingual, uh, some of them being very skilled craftspeople, uh, some of them uh, having skills in other areas, um, as well as the members of the secret society. In all the accounts that I've read of the Amistad Revolt, I don't think I ever knew those things about those people. Um, how does that reflect on what happened? Obviously, the Poro society was critical. It, it was, but what I think that set of evidence suggests to us is that previously what historians had done was read the newspapers when the court case was in session. Mm -hmm. And they didn't always read the newspapers at the other time. So it turns out, in, in my view, the most important time to be reading the newspapers and also reading correspondence, was in the period just before the Amistad Africans are getting ready to go back to Africa, when their knowledge of their homeland becomes very important to the abolitionists about how they're going to get there. Mm -hmm. So their teacher, a Mr. Booth, a Yale undergraduate, wrote a series of letters. I think two of them were published in a fairly small abolitionist newspaper in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania Freeman in which he relates all the things he's learned about their lives back in Africa. He says they come from large towns, some of them are weavers. And so, to me, that evidence has always been there, mm -hmm. but the overwhelming emphasis on the legal side of the story meant that we weren't attuned to other things we needed mm -hmm. to know about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so that became important. Uh, the, the missionary archives that Robert mentioned are crucial, and, and there is a letter in there that I think is important uh, in, in, in really stunning ways. Uh, a young woman named Hannah Moore went from being a missionary among the Cherokee to the Mende Mission mm -hmm. in Sierra Leone in 1852, 13 years after the original uprising. And at one of, I think it was a holiday meal or something, there are still four or five of the Amistad Africans who were at the mission. All the rest have gone home to their families, which is what they wanted anyway. 
But this young woman says, well, what's your memory of the Amistad Rebellion? And they basically give her their oral history. And she writes it all down. And there is evidence in there of a kind that you will not find in any other source, including information on the debate that happened in the hold of the ship as they're preparing uh, to rise up and capture it. So, so I, guess, I guess what I'm saying is that the history from below means that you have to use all different kinds mm -hmm. of sources, wherever you can gather them, to try to piece together the lives of people who didn't leave very many documents mm -hmm. of their own. Tammy, let's talk a little bit about um, Margu, the character that uh, you have portrayed. Um, what have you learned about her? She was one of the children on the ship. Yes, Margu was one of the four children, which most people fail to realize that there were children aboard the Amistad. Um, she was taken between the age of seven and 11, and she was also taken before what we call in this country the rites of passage. Um, just as there was a Poro society, there was a Sandy society, and she would miss out. And that out. was the society for women? That was the society for women. Mm -hmm. And so she would miss out on that rite of passage and when she was snatched away from her home. And what I tried to do with the portraying of Margot is to bring the human factor in, because like Marcus said, we, most people focus on the legal aspect of the case and the legal um, aspect of the event, but I like to focus on the human aspect of what it did, not only to the children, but to the families as a whole when their loved ones are taken away. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting that uh, the professor discovered it was the little girls who were uh, not in chains who yes. discovered the weapons. Yes. Yes, very, um, it was very um, helpful because they had the freedom to move around. So when Cinque was able to get the rusty nail and to unlock the chains, they were able to defend themselves because the kids, um, Magu and the other three, were able to get those um, weapons to them. I did find one of the things little girls did. Uh, everyone has probably seen in the movie the story of uh, Professor Gibbs who learned a few words of Mende and marched up and down the waterfront of New York counting from one to ten, whereupon two Mende sailors who happened to be there came up and introduced themselves and became the translators. And this, of course, is uh, the, the, the brilliant uh, work of the Yale professor. Well, several days before Professor Gibbs shows up in any of the documents about people visiting the jail, one correspondent says, the little girls had pulled aside several gentlemen inside the jail and were teaching them to count from one to 10 in their native language. <laughs> Interesting. So Professor Gibbs may have gotten his best idea from, from the three that little girls. That wouldn't surprise any of us women here, probably. <laughs> um, I thought it was uh, very moving, and I feel you know a little bit of a chill having you here after having written that book, now being in this courtroom, uh, now knowing more about what these people were like. And I wonder what it's like for you to be here at the Old State House. It's a thrill. It's a thrill. I, I put a great stock in the power of place, mm. in understanding how things happen. So uh, the, and I do believe that, that uh, the spirit of a building can matter. Mm -hmm. So I tried very hard to imagine all the different settings where the Amistad Africans uh, spent their lives in their native lands, in Lomboko slave trading factory, on a slave ship called the Tesora, the slave pens of Havana, the Amistad New Haven jail, and then various courtrooms. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, you know, what, did, what would they have made of a place like this? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll tell you one thing that I learned on my recent trip to Sierra Leone. There is a tradition of rhetorical eloquence that Cinque clearly embodied. This is something that actually is a, a, a very important part of Mende society, in which people would come together in their West African village version of this room and have a debate. Yeah. And so everybody who heard Senke speak, even when he was only speaking in Mende, as he did on this fundraising tour, everybody marveled. I mean, people would write, I didn't understand a word he said, but I thought he was one of the greatest speakers I ever heard. <laughs> right? Those were all the skills he had learned in the West African equivalent of this kind of place where disputes were adjudicated. And we actually saw this happening in one village while we were there. It was fascinating to see. So again, that's part of his African heritage. That's part of who he was. He was a very gifted speaker in a specific tradition of Mende storytelling. And so what he would do on these uh, 
this fundraising tour is step up and tell the story of the rebellion. And he would act it out as he told it, but it was all in Mende. But see, that was a political comment. I'm Mende. That's who I am. And you're all going to have to deal with that. So do the best you can and understand me. Well, it's interesting that you talk about that tour. That, of course, was after the court decision, and they were raising money um, for their lodging, for their education, and to be able to go home. And they raised quite a lot of money on that speaking tour. Um, but Robert, uh, while they were in New Haven, and, and I, I suppose also in Farmington to some extent, but particularly when they were jailed in New Haven, they were almost really became celebrities. Um, thousands of people would come to see them. And uh, the role of pop culture, if you will, we don't really think about pop culture in, the, in that time period, but the role of pop culture was tremendous in getting their story told and in how people felt about them. Yes, it definitely was, and I think this is something we haven't talked about uh, with respect to Marcus's book that's fabulous. There are all sorts of pop culture moments going on. There are wax figurines, there are huge murals, there are plays, there are poems, um, and this is clearly a medium that speaks to a much wider audience. Now, the evangelical abolitionists probably didn't partake of too many of those things. They had their own sort of means of, of communicating about these events. But it's very clear that the Amistad is a, was a much bigger event in its day than simply a few court cases. Mm -hmm. In fact, Tammy, we, um, we get the sense that uh, people you know, who read uh, the penny newspapers and things heard about them and that that may have strengthened the mood in the country that surrounded this debate because people, factory workers and people like that were talking about these people and calling Sinke the George Washington of the period. Um, yes, they were fascinated with the story and um, a lot of the fascination comes from the fact that the common attitude was that the Africans were not intelligent, that they could not learn or that they just were beneath everyone else. And the fact that um, not only were they capturing the essence of the moment that they were in, but they were able to um, portray or to get their sense of what they needed out of it at the time. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the time that they spent in Farmington. Um, Tammy, I'll start with you. When that started and how they were treated when they went to Farmington and why? Well, the reason they, um, and after the trial was over and they um, won their freedom, they had to have a place to stay and the abolitionists had taken them into Farmington and there they were well received. Um, what I recently found out, which was uh, very fascinating to me, is the connection to the deaf community. Um, author Kim Silva, she, she has written a book, Sign of Freedom, which will be published soon. Um, I met her last year after one of her presentations, and she introduced me to that aspect of the story, that uh, Margot stayed with the Porter family, and they had a deaf son by the name of Samuel. Uh, while in Farmington, they, went, they stayed at an apartment above a store, and they were also um, fed and um, educated at Mrs. Friedman's boarding house. They would go there for their food and clothing, and then they would go off to school. So the community accepted them and embraced them, and they were very happy that they were there. And after a while, that's when they got together with the missionaries to start their tour to get money to go back home. Mm -hmm. So they were very well received. By the way, if anyone would like to ask a question, um, we'd be happy to uh, have you do that. You can just raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you if you'd like to ask anything. So um, please feel free to participate. Um, Marcus, I'm wondering when you went to Sierra Leone, um, what did you hear about how these Mendy men and these other, other uh, Amistad Africans, how they were received when they returned, when they did go back to Sierra Leone? It was a difficult reception in the sense that there was great danger for people trying to pass from Freetown back to the places where they were originally from because the wars of the slave trade were still going on. And we know that in certain instances, there was uh, sheer tragedy involved in that return because Sinke did return to his village. And he discovered when he got there that the village had been completely destroyed. Yeah. His wife and three children were missing. And uh, so there was really no homecoming for him. And he lived a, a sort of a mobile life thereafter as a trader. We tried to find Cinque's village in Sierra Leone. And he said that he was from a place called Japoahun, which basically means the prosperous land in Mende. The problem is there were three different Japoahuns in Sierra Leone. Uh, 
Well, one of them we knew was wrong because it was in the wrong place. We went to what we thought was the most likely, but as soon as we got there, we discovered not the right place. Nobody had any idea. Nothing made any sense. We had just... We just failed. The third village we went to, we were only able to find because Conrad Tookshur, a, a specialist in Sierra Leonean history at St. John's, took our map, our detailed map, over to a group of Sierra Leonean truck drivers and said, help us find Japoahun. I said, well, there's this place over here that's not on the map. There's a third one, so why don't you go there? So we went there, we met with elders, and we knew that we were in the right place because a man that uh, Sinke mentioned as his king was a king in that region mm -hmm. in what they called slavery times. But we couldn't get any further until a very elderly woman said, she had the most ex astonishing memory through her, I think it was her great grandmother, she said, back in those days, all of the villages in this area were destroyed in war, this would have been King Shaka's soldiers, and everybody was consolidated into four villages. And she told us what they were. So it's quite likely that when Sinke's village was destroyed, his wife and children went to one of these other villages, but he may not have been able to find them. He may not have known. So great was the devastation. So I guess what I'm saying is that a victory in the Amistad case did not necessarily mean a victory in the struggle against the slave trade in Sierra Leone, where people's lives were still being ruined by this terrible force. Robert, did a victory in the Amistad case um, make a big difference in the anti-slavery movement in this country? I, I found it interesting in Marcus's book that he talks about people who were in favor of the Amistad Africans getting their freedom, but pointed out, I am not an abolitionist. Right. So it was a very fine line. Yeah, that's actually, that's a very good point. Um, so in terms of the legal history, the legal trajectory of American history, the Amistad case plays almost no role. So if you page forward and you try to find the number of cases in which the Amistad decision is cited, you will come up with a handful. And they are cited not for anything related to slavery, but simply for a particular passage about whether or not you can look behind documents presented from a foreign government, right? Um, but in terms of what it means in the trajectory of American political and sort of social history, it does mean, I think, more than we've realized for precisely the reason that you just mentioned. If you read the letters that are written to the then Amistad Committee, they are filled with these passages that say, although I am not an abolitionist, here's five dollars, right? Um, what this suggests is that there is a growing sense of dissatisfaction not necessarily with the institution of slavery, but with, with the ways in which the federal government is being controlled by those who own slaves. Mm. And in a sense, it is a step along the path towards civil war. But it is a step, and that's, that's a, in a sense, it's a very different part of a story. Do we have questions uh, from anybody in the audience? I thought I saw some hands over here, yes? I just want to ask uh, Robert and, the, uh, and uh, Professor Redeker and Tammy to uh, uh, build on Robert's last point. Uh, Professor Redeker said uh, very powerfully uh, that the Amistad uh, story uh, stirred up a lot of debate. And my question then is, again, build on uh, what Robert said, is how many minds did it change about slavery or about uh, Africans? You know, I think it changed a lot of people's minds in Connecticut. And the reason why I think it did is because the very presence of those people here, with so many thousands filing through the jail, punctured some of the race, racist stereotypes. In Farmington, for example, people had an opportunity to get to know these political prisoners as real people to see that they're really like everyone else, that they have honesty and decency and core values and, see, I think it's, once, in, in those moments when ideology comes into contact with a certain kind of reality, new learning can take place and that you're no longer governed by the things that you thought you knew. So I think that uh, this state is probably a very good example of, uh, of, of how it could change minds. 
Now, how far it changed minds in terms of turning people into abolitionists, it's, it's very hard to say. But at the very least, some of the racist stereotypes that even the New York Morning Herald is still pumping out during the trial, they're not working on people anymore. Uh, and, and, and to me, what's fascinating is the broad base of support that was developed for the Amistad Africans around here. I think that's quite significant. Tammy? Well, I think that in some instances, it did change the mind of some people to say that, okay, they are intellectual, but at the same time, um, it really didn't help as much. For instance, when Margu came back and she went to college in Oberlin College, the facade was um, Oberlin Collegiate College accepted Africans and we welcomed them. That was the outside, but behind closed mm -hmm. doors, Magu was very isolated and alone mm -hmm. because no one really associated with her because she was made to still feel as if she was different and that she did not belong. And she also had the same issue when she was a part of the missionary school. Um, here we are Christian sisters. We have introduced you to Christian ways and you are now our Christian sister. But yet, when she was at the missionary school and she wanted to give the villagers the gifts that were given to them from America, she was chastised because she was giving out too much. So it's sort of a two-edged sword of, oh yeah, we see that you can do the same thing what we, we can do. However, I want to keep you in this box because that's what I originally thought of you. I, I would have, I mean, to answer your question directly, Don, I don't think it made many abolitionists, but I think it made many more anti-slavery people. I don't think, I mean, What's certain, the difference, Robert? Well, so the abolitionists were committed in the 1830s to the immediate end of slavery. Um, but there were a large, large swath of people who over the antebellum period grew to despise the institution of slavery, but as Tammy says, without necessarily believing in equality, right? They, 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 they loathe the institution and what it did to the country. So I would say that the, the rhetoric that we see is part of the foundation that is laid in political terms, just looking politically, for the Liberty Party and the Free Soil Party. I mean, the, the evangelical abolitionists certainly hoped for more. They believed that the arrival of the captives, as Marcus says in the book, was providential. God brought the Amistad to them so that they could begin the evangelization of Africa. Um, and they saw in Sinke the person who would kind of transcend a lot of prejudice. Um, but at the same time, I think the wider audience was not interested in the same concerns. I, I, to follow up on, on that, I'm, uh, uh, even though Connecticut did start a, a gradual manumission, of slaves in the 1790s. It mm -hmm. didn't officially end the slavery until 1848, actually one of the last northern states to do so. Um, and uh, the journal Connecticut History recently published an article talking about the, the perception of, of uh, Frederick Douglass and other famous abolitionists with two various cities in Connecticut where, in fact, he encountered incredible racism. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment on, like, more of a, an additional uh, comment about the local scene. Mm -hmm. Who wants to start? I, I'll just mention that I think one of the discoveries of scholarship about the North in the pre-Civil War era in recent years is that racism was much more extensive than the mythology would have it. Very extensive. Uh, so in some ways, that makes this case even more unusual. And I should mention that there were anti-abolitionist and anti-black riots in all of the major cities in the 1830s. This is a, a major part of the reality. Uh, and yet, there were never any physical attacks on the Amistad Africans. I think their celebrity protected them to some extent. So, so in some ways, uh, to address Seal's question, I think it intensified the struggle. I think that some people broke free of the racism, but at the same time, mixed race churches are still being burned. So both things can coexist and did coexist, but I think there's no doubt if you look at the newspaper debates, I think the both abolitionist and anti-slavery forces, and I don't think they're identical, I agree very much with what Robert said about that, they're winning. 
And believe me, the howl of the pro-slavery papers suggests that they knew they were winning, mm -hmm. at least on this case. I would, I mean, um, to take an example, Seal, from the court cases in Connecticut, um, yes, I mean, so slavery ends officially in 1848. But in the last years, when there are only a few dozen people in slavery legally in Connecticut, um, slavery doesn't go, I mean, slavery goes out quietly in the historical record, but it doesn't go out quietly for the people who are trapped in it. Those who are still enslaved in Connecticut are elderly because they were enslaved before the gradual, uh, manu gradual emancipation law was passed at the end of the 18th century. And there are a handful of court cases, and I, I'm, by that I mean two or three, in which uh, people who inherit elderly slaves free them, right? And see, so essentially, you know, it's a, it's, you know, a beneficent act that you are free now. But of course, it's, it's not a beneficent act. It's, it's releasing an elderly person who can no longer earn a living out into the street. And there were court cases because in those days, the poor laws required the town to step in to protect someone who's indigent. And so the town turns around and sues the family for manumitting the person. Um, those cases are very few, but they suggest a really ugly end to slavery. We have a question over here. Um, John Quincy Adams, did he represent the Amistad slaves for political reasons or because he really believed they should be set free? I, you know, my view is, is this. I, I went into my project with a lot of skepticism about John Quincy Adams, and especially skepticism about the role he's played in the telling of the story. I came out the other end of the study with much more respect for him, partly because I think his interest was sincere. A man of his accomplishment did not have to take on this case, and he did say at one point, that if he could do anything to assist these people in gaining their freedom, it would be the greatest achievement of his life. Now, he was 72 years old at this time, and he had been president. He had a long list of accomplishments. He also visited them in jail, and he was not happy about their conditions, and he let the local abolitionists know it. All that said, it's not his fault that the subsequent telling of the tale made him the hero of it, okay? He had his own reasons to be interested. What strikes me as most important about his role is that the young Amistad boy, Kale, with the help of the elders, wrote John Quincy Adams a letter and told him exactly what he was supposed to say to the Supreme Court. The, the, this 11-year-old little boy tells the former president, okay, here, here's who we are, here's what we want you to say. He didn't exactly say what he was told, but he did say the fundamentals. So I thought that it was fascinating that the Amistad Africans are basically saying, okay, you're going to be our representative, here's what we want you to represent. And first and foremost, we want to go home. That's our definition of freedom. We don't want anything that's not going to allow us to go home. That's what we want. We are Africans, and that's what we want. So I think John Quincy Adams' role was honorable, but it is not fair either to the people who participated in that case or to us who came later to make him the hero of the story. I think those 53 people collectively are the hero of that story, and in doing what they did, they gained some very important allies. And some of those allies were very distinguished people like John Quincy Adams. But let's not put the cart in front of the horse. Right? John Quincy Adams is there because those people had the courage to seize their freedom. So I'd like to, you know, he, he appears in my book in chapter six, <laughs> the last chapter. <laughs> right? He's not the story. He only comes in at the end. Now, he's a hell of a pinch hitter when he comes in, <laughs> but it's not his story, in my view. And I, I agree with that. Um, and I will add that one of the things that I, I should start by saying, like, like Marcus, I have this, um, naturally, I recoil about the notion of the great men in history. And so I went into it with a lot of what's in it for John Quincy. Right? And it, it's clear Martin Van Buren betrayed him politically. There's, you, you read the documents, and John Quincy Adams wants a, 
wants a chunk out of Martin Van Buren. There's no <laughs> doubt. But there's also something else going on. Van Buren, I mean, uh, Adam's family has opposed slavery for a long time. Um, he is steeped in the values of the American Revolution. He does not believe that slavery is moral. And even after the Supreme Court case is over, Adams isn't done. He's not satisfied with the verdict that the Supreme Court renders because it doesn't give the vessel, the Amistad, and its possessions to the Africans. His argument is that the uh, US naval officers had no authority to stop the vessel. They were bound to see that vessel as a vessel of a foreign power in control of a foreign people. Therefore, they're entitled to it, or to the assumption that it is theirs. And so even after he's won the case, he writes this really long editorial about how the Supreme Court on this point is wrong. Sometimes winning is just not enough. <laughs> I don't think it ever was for John Quincy Adams. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from the audience? We have a few more minutes if uh, anybody would like to ask one. Sure, let me get you the microphone. Thank you. The, uh, as you know, the other uh, big event that took place in this building right above us was the Hartford Convention in 1815. And so, as you mentioned, Adam's family legacy, I'm thinking of the old Federalists who gathered here uh, for those three weeks in the end of 1814 and 1815. And one of the proposals they came up for the Constitution gets back to what you were saying, Professor, about um, the, attacking the Three-Fifths Compromise. And so while we wouldn't consider them proto-abolitionists or, or somehow that they were early abolitionists, they weren't. And Sean Valence has made that pretty clear in his scholarship. But um, there's certainly a piece of it there where New England already has its strong reservations about what's later going to be called a slave power conspiracy. And this is the beginning of that attack, to say that uh, the slave owners have a disproportionate amount of control over our government. And so I, I like that that happened here as well. Mm. I think there's a, a nice uh, piece of the story that, that those two things go together. So I don't think I have a great question. I just had to say something else about this building. So. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. <laughs> um, I thought it was uh, very interesting that um, you made the comment in the book, um, Marcus, about, and this just really hit me. So many of us have seen this story uh, in which the American legal system is the hero, hmm. the same system that held 2.5 million African Americans in bondage in this country at that time. To me, that's the ultimate contradiction of the Spielberg film. Mm -hmm. It's also a contradiction of some of the scholarship uh, because uh, it is true that the Supreme Court could rule narrowly on this case and leave all that very safely in place. So if, if, if you want to talk in terms of heroes, uh, I, I think it's, uh, we, we should look in a different direction. Uh, I think it's uh, a matter of of understanding the history from below, of not seeing this as a case in which a few benevolent people rescued these poor benighted Africans who couldn't do anything for themselves. And the abolitionists play a role in fostering that image, calling them hapless victims. Mm -hmm. Hapless victims, they had just done something astonishing. They had captured a slave ship and sailed it 1,400 miles. Doesn't sound hapless to me. So, uh, so in a way, it's about uh, the legacy of this and how we live with it. How do we live with the, the memory of this event? Uh, the United States government was completely committed to returning these people to slavery. If you want to know something about the government, that's the thing to remember, right? Not that the legal system worked. <laughs> Uh, Martin Van Buren really did not want to upset the southern slave owners, so he was ready to send them back if everybody would just be quiet about this issue. <laughs> but they wouldn't. They wouldn't be quiet. They had a lot of things to say. Robert, uh, uh, Marcus talked about the legacy. Um, you also talk in your writings and, and in your class about the memory, the, the, what comes down in memory about this. I'm going to have you talk about that a little bit. That's a big topic. Um, I mean, in some ways, the, when I talk about memory, I look at the ways in which the Amistad story has been told going through into the future. And so um, I do follow a lot of the same things that Marcus does in the last chapter of his book, Reverberations. Um, and the, the, the movie is a good example, right? If you look at the way that, that Steven Spielberg takes the story, look, it's a, it's a cinemagraphically, it's a wonderful film, right? But it is a, a false tale 
um, that, that, that tries to take some of the African story seriously, but then frames it in this guise that suggests that in the end, liberty prevails because it's right. It's the righteous thing. And as Marcus says, it, it doesn't play that way at all. The court rules narrowly. I mean, yet we want to believe mm -hmm. that the court did the right thing. Um, the court could rule narrowly on a salvage case. And, and in so doing, it may have set the Africans free, but it didn't do a thing to change slavery in the United States. And the Dred Scott decision is just around the corner. Tammy, you were nodding during that. Um, yes, I agree with what he was saying. Um, when I do my performances in the after um, with the Q&A, sometimes I get the question about the Amistad movie, and my response is, it is a great Hollywood tell. The only great thing I really like about the movie is that it got people talking about the Amistad, and um, I would refer people to other sources to get the true story of the, of the Amistad um, incident. So that's really why I was nodding my head, because he's right, it is a Hollywood tell, but mm -hmm. it did get the Amistad story out there, and it got people talking, and. That's why we're here today. So mm -hmm. it sort of served its purpose in that regard. I'm waiting for Spike Lee's version. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> Have you suggested maybe that he ought to write that? Yeah, I'll give him a copy of my book. I think there's, <laughs> I, I think there's a screenplay in your book. I, I truly do. I saw it all as I was reading it. Um, well, we're just about out of time now. So if, uh, any, if no one else has a question, yes, one more question. OK. Hi, I'm from Farmington with the Historical Society. and. Um, I, want, I have a question about the abolitionist, and um, I'm not questioning their sincerity and on a, abolishing slavery. Um, certainly in Farmington, I think in a way um, it was a respite for the Mendy. Um, the Farmington people gave them a big chunk of land to grow their food. They sewed clothing for them. They gave them tutoring. They treated them very well. But they're, as I've read a lot about the history, I wonder if there wasn't a side agenda, because when they were um, taking them around to various churches for fundraising, and, um, and Sinke was certainly a fabulous speaker and um, drew a large crowd, but they also were really encouraged, they taught them hymns and were encouraging them to recite scripture. And I, it's my understanding, I may be wrong, but that they, um, the little bit of English they knew was um, often from scripture with kind of, you mentioned earlier, um, maybe a side agenda um, of returning them to Sierra Leone to spread the word, you know, as a missionary. And then with um, Magru, or Magru um, who took on the name, I guess, Sarah, because Sarah Porter, um, you know, helped, she was very, a very big influence. But when she returned from Oberlin, went back to Sierra Leone, um, didn't she teach in a missionary school? Okay, my, so the long way around, the question is, they, um, they were Mendi, but from various tribes, they spoke many different languages, and I'm assuming had different religions. Were the abolitionists successful, in your opinion, when they returned to Sierra Leone, as far as um, converting them? Did they go back to their um, I'm assuming tribal religions, some were probably Muslim. Um, I spoke a bit with Peg Young, who did a huge amount of research on this and wrote our curriculum for our little community. And she, um, before she died, she really questioned that. She said, um, I wonder what the ulterior motive was here. It, it was not a side agenda. Yes. It was a central agenda. Because right, right, right. the, uh, especially the evangelical abolitionists, yes. were Christian imperialists. Absolutely. They they believed in one truth, one God, one way, and they wanted the Amistad Africans to adhere to that way. The Amistad Africans themselves, though, had a different view. They said, "We understand what is important to these abolitionists. We will do our part." But even as they are studying religion. Christianity, they are insisting that their identity is that of the Mende people. We are the Mende people, they keep saying. This is the way they talk about themselves in the last year or so before they go back. And there is a claim for sovereignty in that. 
right? You're the American people, we're the Mende people, okay? That's why, that's why Sinke speaks in Mende. So that when they go back to West Africa, most of the Africans go back to their homelands, to the way things were before. A few and mostly the children stay at the mission because they don't have very good other options, in my view. So I, I, the Mende mission itself, whether that was successful, um, a young man named Joe Yanelli is doing a very important study of that, and he's going to show that it really did make a difference in terms of promoting anti-slavery activity in Sierra Leone. But the Amistad Africans themselves, very few of them remained convinced Christians, and Louis Tappan and others knew this uh, even at the moment when they left. We think, he said, maybe three or four will continue to receive the message. So even though they did everything they could to push this Christian message, it, wasn't, it was not in the main successful. Well, we're just about out of time now, so unless we have one more question, um, I think I'm going to wrap it up. I don't see any. Yes, we do have a question here. Let's get you the mic. I don't really have a question, but I wanted to address what you said about a building's spirit and what Diane said about feeling... Um, not, not eerie, but having a yeah. funny feeling. Having a chill, yeah. A chill here. I have the same one, and I don't know if anybody else feels that in here, but I believe the spirits of the former Mende, the Mende tribe that was here before St. Ku, I think they're here, and I think they're pleased. That's all. Thank you for that. Thank you. As, as people who treasure this building, that means a lot to us. Um, I think we'll wrap up by just letting each of you have an opportunity to make one final statement about uh, what this whole story still says to us today. And Robert, I'll start with you. Well, I think I'm going to echo uh, something that Mark has said, is that we have a chance here to really see this history as a history from below, a history from a, from a people's perspective rather than the history from John Quincy Adams' perspective, as interesting as that might be. Um, the Amistad story is a story of the African diaspora. Um, and there are parts that we haven't touched on today, um, but, but are touched on in Marcus's book, that it is African-American churches that raise a sizable chunk of the funds, that there's, there's an affinity there for these Africans right, from Sierra Leone that is still something that we would like to know more about. Um, we also know that there, are, that there were Africans in the Americas um, in places like Pennsylvania who wanted to come to Connecticut to help. So that there is a really powerful story here um, that is, I guess, the African diaspora that is very easily overlooked when we study U.S. history as U.S. history. And I just want to ask you, um, when will your book be out, and does it have a title yet? Um, it does not have a title yet, although I refer to the manuscript as Amistad Remembered, but we're a little early to say that it's coming out yet. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Tammy, a final thought on this? Uh, well, my final thought is as an educator at one of the local museums who actually interpreted the exhibit of the Amistad as well as to bring their story to life to um, school-age children as well as the community, I am glad that the story does continue to be told and that the actual truth is being told, that it's not just about the legal case, that it is about an enduring spirit of a people who refuse to be captive, but to um, pursue their freedom. And because of that pursuit of their freedom, that story is still being told today of how freedom and equality is important to everyone. Marcus, I, I last agree, word. I agree very much with what Tammy just said. The reason why this story matters to us is because of our own freedom. In other words, we reach back to certain moments in the past because those things speak to us in the present. And that's why the interpretation of the past changes, because the questions we ask about it change. So what does it mean that this small group of Africans banded together, this motley crew, and won their freedom in what is a stunningly unlikely outcome? It's shocking that they won, and yet they did. So what can we learn from that? What kind of inspiration can we take from that? Uh, how can we make that part of our history as we move forward, because I'll tell you, one of the results of uh, writing this book, The Slave Ship, folks, we live with the ghosts of slavery every minute of every day. Whether we want to admit it or not, they are with us, they are in this room, but at the same time, so is the spirit of the people who fought against it. 
So let's take both those things on board and make that part of our present and our future because that's the way to make progress, to face the past, to think about those things and to, to really make them part of a big debate in the present about what kind of future we want. Professor, thank you so much. Um, Professor Wolf, thank you for joining us. Tammy Denise, thank you for being with us. Marcus Redeker, it was a real pleasure to have you here. It was our honor to have you at the Old State House. Thank you all for being part of this, and uh, please look for the broadcast on CTN.